Here's another quick video on cellulitis and necrotizing fasciitis. Grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at cellulitis and necrotizing fasciitis. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon so you never miss such amazing content every time I post. Drop a comment, drop a like to Zambia and beyond, grab a piece of paper and let's go. So here's a warm up question. A 47 year old patient is admitted to casualty with swelling of the left leg of spontaneous onset. She has a fever and the leg feels warm. List two differentials what bacteria is likely to be the cause? What two important questions would you ask for in the history to determine the etiological factors? What four signs would you look for in the examination? What two blood investigations would you do? What antibiotic is indicated and what route of administration is recommended? So you may pause the video, write the answers down. I will give you the answer at the end of the screen. Rather, the end of the video, not the screen. So let's begin with cellulitis and erysipelas. So remember that when we talk about cellulitis, this is just simply inflammation of the dermis in the subcutaneous tissue. Remember that the skin is divided into an epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis, which is the subcutaneous tissue. So that when you talk of cellulitis, it's just affecting the dermis and the subcutaneous tissue. And remember that most of this is going to be due to group A streptococci and it's also going to be due to staphylococcus aureus. Erysipelas on the other hand is just the superficial cellulitis that's going to be affecting the dermis and the upper part of the subcutaneous tissue and it is commonly due to group A streptococci. So remember that for the pathogen to actually get entry into the skin there has to be some form of breakage, there's some form of trauma that has to occur for the skin to actually be broken. So some lesions include trauma, ulcers, bites, skin damage that can be from chronic conditions like other dermatological conditions which may be precipitating factors for cellulitis and erysipelas. Risk factors include previous history of cellulitis, chronic diseases like diabetes, chronic kidney as well as uh, liver disease as well as cancers, immunodeficiency with HIV, AIDS being the most common form of immunodeficiency in our setting, venous insufficiency, age, as well as skin diseases like tinea pedis. What clinical features would you expect to see? So on the skin, there is some inflammation that's taking place. Re remember that inflammation is going to be marked by certain types of uh, features, which are the rubo, dolor, tumor, Carlo and Functiolesa, which are pretty much the uh, characteristics of inflammation. So there will be pain, it will be hot, it will be red, and it will be swollen. And of course, if it's affecting an entire limb, you may have loss of function, which is Functiolesa, which is coming from Latin words. So cellulitis is actually poorly demarcated, while erysipelas is going to be raised and well demarcated. This is one difference between cellulitis and erysipelas. Then Cellulitis may also be associated with a skin abscess and the common sites are usually the lower legs so you may have a bilateral lower leg cellulitis which is rare and often this can be misdiagnosed for venous eczema. Erysipelas on the other hand tends to occur most commonly on the face where it's going to be having this asymmetrical butterfly distribution on the cheeks and the bridge of the nose and can also be seen at cannula sites and possibly even with phlebitis. Some non-dermatological features of cellulitis include lymphadenopathy. You also may get systemic features such as a fever. And this is commoner with, or much more common with erysipelas, where it's going to be actually preceding the skin signs by about an hour or some hours or so. What investigations are we going to do? Diagnosis is largely clinical. So we want to inspect the affected area. We we'll look for any portal of entry, so any breakage in the skin, you ask about a history of trauma. We draw the edge around the area to monitor the progress to see if this infection is spreading. Then of course we swab the area for a culture only. This is only needed for severe or resistant infection or unusual exposures. For example, penetrating injuries, waterborne or even uh, waterborne acquired uh, injuries. Then some Blood investigations include a full blood count which may show a raised white blood cell count, C-reactive protein which may be increased, 
uh, blood couches and even D-dimers, of course, to rule out DVT because this is one of the differentials that you must look out for. Get an imaging, a foot x-ray or an x-ray of the part that is affected. Remember, most of the time it's going to be affecting the lower limbs to rule out some osteomyelitis as well as an ultrasound and do a well score to rule out DVT. How do you manage this patient? So key thing is, of course, antibiotics. So we give them flu, uh, flucloxacillin about um, for five to seven days orally, and this is usually the first line of management. For the patients that are actually allergic to penicillins, we can actually give them doxycycline or clarithromycin orally as well for about five to seven days. Alternatively, in our setting, we usually just put them on cloxacillin. And if cloxacillin isn't available, we put them on coamoxiclav in combination with metronidazole. That's usually the combination that we give our patients in our setting. And then if it's near the eyes or the nose, or it's due to a human bite or an animal bite, do not forget to add coamoxiclav to that regimen. And then if it's severe, consider the cephalosporins, things like cefuroxim, things like ceftriaxin, then you may consider your other uh, flucloxacillin, your coamoxiclavs, or your clindamycin as IV this time because it's a severe infection. If it's MRSA, which is methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, vancomycin can actually be used, and these are the other alternatives that can be used. Cover them with analgesia. Simple analgesia is adequate enough, so your paracetamol, your diclofenac, elevate the leg to ease the pain. And of course, if it's at the site of the cannula, remove the cannula and recite the cannula. You should culture the tip of the needle to see whatever you are growing from that. So complications include thrombophlebitis, sepsis, toxic shock syndrome, lymphangitis and secondary lymphedema, and sometimes this can result in cavernous sinus thrombosis if it's occurring on the face. Now we move on to necrotizing fasciitis. This is actually quite rare now because of the advent of antibiotics and generally hygiene and care in the hospital has increased. So this is a rare, but it is a life-threatening infection that's going to be affecting the soft tissue and it has a quite high mortality. Most patients actually go into sepsis and actually die because of the necrotizing fasciitis. So what's the pathophysiology? Remember that we have the skin which is supposed to be protecting you from entry of bacteria into the body. So there's a break in the skin which is going to lead to the entry of the bacteria into the body, into the skin. So this is maybe following surgery, it may be following trauma, an IV injection, or even an insect bite. And once this infection now gets into the body, it rapidly spreads across the facial planes, and this can actually lead to tissue death of the fascia as well as the subcutaneous tissue, which is what we call our necrotizing fasciitis. So it can either be of two types, polymicrobial, which is type 1, or it could be monomicrobial, which is type 2. Polymicrobial meaning that there's more than one bacteria bacteria or more than one causative agent that is responsible, while it's monomicrobial is often attributed to one with group A streptococcus being the most common cause of the tissue destruction because of the production of the exotoxins A, B, and C. You may have a severe type of or a type of necrotizing fasciitis which is known as Fournier's gangrene. So this one is a polymicrobial necrotizing fasciitis which generally affects the male perineum so it can actually is usually from a breach in the GI or the urethral mucosa. It's much more common in older men and in men with immunosuppression. I would have added some image images to this but I think the YouTube guidelines would actually take down the video. So I just Google what Fournier's gangrene actually looks like and have a look at those pictures. They're quite nasty. Then... Risk factors include IV drug use, obesity, and diabetes. These are three major risk factors for necrotizing fasciitis and immunosuppression. Clinical features, remember you have this rapidly expanding inflamed area of skin. It may progress to a bullet, which is like this fluid-filled uh, blister coat and coat and dusky purplish discoloration. Then there is some severe pain that's out of proportion to the skin signs. There may be some crepitus, which is this crackling sound, which you feel on palpation. Eventually, the patient may go into sepsis. They may also have some systemic symptoms. Investigations include a full blood count, which may show an increased white blood cell count. You may also have a, an increase in your lactate levels. And once you do an x-ray, a CT scan or an MRI, this may actually aid in the diagnosis. And you may actually see the gas in the tissues, and this should not actually even delay referral, and surgery should actually be indicated if they 
clinical suspicion is high without you actually even getting the x-rays the ct scans or the mris you may actually need to take this patient to theater then management of course is surgical urgent surgical debridement we cover them on iv antibiotics we can even escalate to carbapenems plus clindamycin plus or minus mrsa cover that's with your vancomycin in some cases we give them intravenous immunoglobulins those these have shown limited evidence according to the clinical trials Coming back to a warm-up question, a 47-year-old female patient is admitted to casualty with swelling of her left leg of spontaneous onset. She has a fever and the leg feels warm. List two differential diagnoses. So this is most likely cellulitis or it's a DVT. So what bacteria? So bacteria, whenever you see bacteria, that's why it's important to read the question. As imagine you write DVT here, then what are you going to write on the bacteria that you're stuck? So what bacteria is likely to be the cause? Most likely streptococcus pyogenes. What two important questions would you ask for in the history to help you determine the etiological factors if there is a past medical history of diabetes or some immunosuppression or if there's a past medical history of trauma or injury? Then what four signs would you look for on examination? Any swelling, any hotness, any redness, any pain? What two blood investigations would you do? So our full blood count, our blood cultures, and if you want our CRP. And of course, what antibiotic of choice would you give? So you'd want to give them penicillins and you want to give it as an IV formulation. I really hope you enjoyed this video on cellulitis and necrotizing fasciitis. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon so you never miss such amazing content every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.